Hello and welcome everyone to day four of the Clock Global Institute. This has been an amazing few days. I want to say thank you to all of our attendees who have brought so much value to each session through feedback, through chat, through Q&A, keep it coming. Um, to our staff team, of which I have the privilege of being a part Hello, of. Hello and welcome everyone to two more of the Clock Global Institute. who have brought so much value into um, our session feedback, chat, and Q&A, to our staff team, of which I have the privilege of being a part of, in building the programming and navigating um, the platform, to our fabulous speakers and sponsors, the experts, who have built top of mind content that's so important to our community, to our sponsors who have spent over a year navigating the virtual world, to bring awareness to their amazing products and their services for our legal community. We cannot thank them enough for their support. All of us contribute to what makes CLOCK so special. Betsy Roach, our executive director, and Mike Haven, our president, touched on an important note for me in the last few days, that together we are the stewards of the next generation of legal operations professionals. You are doing that. You are doing, you are supporting that. Um, by being a CLOCK supporter and member, you aren't just investing in your career, but you're also investing in others. Through your time, expertise, and your membership, you support those entering our professional, uh, into our profession through their academic and business journey. In fact, did you know that CLOCK runs an annual scholarship program to ensure the future of our industry? Over the past five years, we have awarded nearly $260,000 in scholarship awards to help fund law school and business school students with an interest in legal operations. Our community is making our industry and our profession more open and accessible, enabling the future of legal ops. Together with our member-driven review team of Daniel Yi from the Department of Justice, Laura Dejeuner from Delta, Christy Gadid from Milan and Mimi Bowen from Sun Life. Together, we send our congratulations to the 10 students who received the award this year. And they are Rachel Sanford, Kelsey Bertrand, Andrew Taylor, Jesse Mesmer, Barbara Tao, Alex Norman, Jamie Fiorito, Sabat Hamad, and Mackenzie Arnold. Congratulations, all of you. You can learn more about each of them and their impressive biographies on clock.org. So with that, now I would like to introduce the general session to kick off our last day. This past Monday, Clock in Research Partnership with ACC released the Clock 2021 State of the Industry Report. I hope you all had a chance to look at it. While we won't be going through each data point of the report, we have invited three of our board members who have reviewed the report in depth, and they're going to provide their thought leadership on some key areas they feel will be the strategic direction of the profession. They'll also spend time responding, responding to your questions around these areas, so please post them in the chat up in the right-hand corner. And from that, I would like to introduce Jen McCarran, our host for today. Jen, take it away. Thank you, Melinda. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, clock and legal ecosystem. I'm Jen McCarran. I serve on the board of directors at Clock. I also host Clock's new podcast called Clock Talk periodically. I hope you're all tuning into that because some of these themes come into that podcast. And who knows, maybe I can have one of you on one day. I'm also the director of legal ops and technology at Netflix. I'm based in Los Angeles, but today I'm joining you from New York City. I'd like to introduce some of our panelists here. Anya Lyons, fellow CLOCK board member. She is the VP and Deputy General Counsel who leads global legal services, operations, and privacy at VMware. She also serves as the Chief of Staff to VMware's General Counsel and joins us today from Ireland. Welcome, Anya. Hi, Jen. I'm loving your CLOCK talk. Good. You were on it. I hope you love it. 
And lastly, we have Lisa Connie serves as well as a board member for CLOCK and is former chief of staff and senior director of legal ops at Adobe. She joins us today from Northern California. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Jen. Hi, everyone. Thank you both for joining. Let's dive right into the key themes that stood out to us in this state of the industry survey results. Those themes are, which we'll talk through today, measuring our own success, professional growth, and the unknown and navigating the unknown. So in our pre-discussion, we corroborated some of these findings with what we're seeing in our companies, as well as what we're hearing these last few days at the Institute and what we see in our clock community chats. So we're bringing all of those viewpoints together and we're seeing a lot of it aligns, which is a good sign. And let's get into our first theme here. Let's talk about measuring our own success. So in legal ops, we talk often about the importance of data and decision-making when it comes to this work. Remember, if it isn't measured, it doesn't matter. So look at the state of the industry report as a way we're measuring our own success year over year. Also remember, when it comes to data, it's not always about just reading these numbers out at each other or at your leadership, but looking at them to find trends and new truths in the data that will inform our decision-making. And always, it's about framing this data so that it tells a story around the value of legal operations. So some of the first insights that jumped out at me and at our other panelists and looking through this report is 59% of legal ops headcount reported in the survey that they report to the general counsel. Another Good statistic to chew on here. The average legal ops team today has seven full-time employees up from a previous survey result of six. So it's demonstrating continued growth in the prevalence, in the scope, and in the stature of this function. When we look over to the insights we're seeing in the clock community boards, a lot of discussions lately on percent allocations for internal headcount to contracted services. Contracted services can be law firms, temp firms, augmentation staff, and the responses we see match our report findings that it really all varies on the company. Some companies had 100% internal resources, 80% internal to 20 external, some had 50-50. So harder there to predict any trends. I think the answer is it varies. I'd like to open up for our first panel question here to Lisa and to Anya. Given this increase in FTEs, right, we went from six average in previous reports to seven. How our members are looking at roles through spend ratios. How would you leverage this report's data to prove the value of a legal ops team and justify the increase of spend? We're just going to start with a huge question. Just... How would you use this data, six people or spend changes? Anya, let's start with you. Oh, I, I love the theme that you're bringing out, which is you know, we tell our legal counterparts within our in-house communities, we tell our law firms and anybody who we interact with, you know, we're the evangelists for bring the data, use the data. So I think as a, as a community, whether you're a law firm, whether you're an alternative service legal provider, or you're an in-house legal ops person, we've got to use this data to spark really conversations. So right away, I, I'm going to make sure that on our legal staff, we get you know this report as a pre-read and we start talking about the trends and even looking at what are other companies spending money on, other in-house legal departments, because you know just around the corner is our investment planning for, for next year. I think I'll be asking my law firm partners to bring this, this data up at the, their managing partner meetings so they can see that you see there's interesting data in there about the work that's going to the alternative legal service providers. And if they're not already interacting with legal ops leads, they should be asking all the GCs that they know, do you have a legal ops lead? And because they don't want to get blindsided and have finance or yeah. a GC who doesn't have legal ops make that decision, law firms need to use this data very strategically as well. And Now that they can see that more, 59% of of legal ops leads are on GC staff, leverage those people and and, and leverage their influence. And I think of legal service providers, I would be saying to them, you may have clients right now who are GCs or legal departments who don't have a legal ops um, person, 
get them, show them this report, show them the value and how this is a leading trend and make sure that they're hiring and you're introducing them to good legal ops people that they can hire um, because for, for service providers, the more legal ops people there are in the industry, the more they're going to articulate the benefit of your services. And actually there's great synergies with us all co-elevating together and yes. just use the data because whoever has the data controls and has the power on some of influencing decisions and the future. And that's what we need to do is leverage this data to drive more change um, in the industry. A high tide raises all boats is what I'm hearing come from you. It's not just about turning around to your leadership and going, I need six people. It's how do we make sure every company has the one, the first legal ops person that can lead this initiative and pioneer it and co-elevate our ecosystem together. Because when every company has this function, that's when we can maximize change in our ecosystem. Lisa, any of that resonating with you? How, how would you use this data? Yeah, thanks, Jen. So it's funny because what struck me is we can't all be pioneers in every single capacity, right? And so the benefit of this report and the data behind it is that you get to look across the industry and see what other people are doing. And there may be places where it's gonna push you to be a little bit more creative and innovative and become a little bit more of a pioneer in that space because you might look at somebody who does have an 80-20 split on, on their spend and think, oh my God, how are, how are they doing that, right? And maybe I'm gonna go have a conversation with that person. And then it spins into a networking conversation as well and building a different connection within the industry. And so there's there's so many different themes and layers to this that it's, yes, the data is fantastic and it's super important, but it can lead you into these spaces of creativity, of innovation, where maybe you weren't the first one to come up with the idea, but when you see that somebody else is doing it and you can have a conversation with them and ask them, you know, pluses, minuses, pros, cons, was it successful? What are your war stories? How can I make this happen? It can breed new information into your own team, your own department. It can lead you to say, okay, now let me leverage some of this other data to prove out why I need this new FTE on my own team, because we're going to spin things differently. Or, you know, maybe I don't need an FTE here, but I'm going to use an outside resource and sort of outsource some of the legal ops stuff. So I, I totally agree with Anya that it all starts with one. We need to, and Jen, I think you were really bringing that point home as well, is that we've got to get legal ops into companies regardless of the size. Because then once you have that, and I think most of us started on teams of one, once you have that initial endpoint, you can just keep building and building. And the data from what everybody else around us is doing just helps shine the spotlight on areas where we can improve and it shines the spotlight also on things that we're doing spectacularly well at, which we can then turn around to our GCs, to our CFOs, to others within the organization and highlight. Yeah. And, and one other thing I'd add is the strategic nature of the role. I mean, when I started out and that's eight or nine years ago, I was not on the GC staff. I was not a, a chief of staff and I was a team of one. And there are many teams of one that are still extremely effective. And so I, I also wouldn't view, you know, FTE in isolation, increase in isolation, because we really need to look at and drink our own champagne on just the knee jerk reaction of always adding headcount and thinking that's a sign of, of success. A sign of success is that you're figuring out really innovative new ways to get work done and drive more value to the business. And I think there are many smaller teams that are hugely effective and they are looking at and, and being really, really brilliant legal ops leaders and saying, what are other ways I can get this work done? I mean, I have to act with integrity on a GC staff team and not adding to my team while I'm telling them that they should be thinking of new ways to do work. So you know, for many years, I haven't actually increased my legal team. Instead, I've outsourced a lot of my legal work um, finding data analysts, financial analysts, and people in an offshore team that do that work so my team can focus on strategic work because we've got to walk the talk and, and model the behavior that we're asking the rest of, of the department or, or our business partners to model. What a key point, walking the talk. The purpose of a legal ops function is to scale a legal department, to stave off the need for hiring, to bring efficiency, more productivity, 
and better uh, use of spend. So if we're doing that, but then saying, well, I need 15 headcount, you can almost uh, counteract or go against that. So how do we ourselves innovate our own scale? I know for me and my function at Netflix, I've been I've leveraged alternative legal service providers, legal outsourcers, tech partners in the market. So I don't have to immediately ramp up with 20 tech analysts, even though I might need that work done. I like to prove it out with outsourced resources first. And then similar to how lawyers and legal staff analyze outsourcing, insourcing work over time, I do the same with tech, with data analysis, with that kind of work. You can see the cost over time and decide when does it belong in versus out. So what a key point when we have to drink our own champagne. And, and Jenna, to be a little bit of a contrarian, I would also say there's the <laughs> element of right-sizing the work. Yes. Because if you know there's people, say lawyers, for example, who are at a much different price point than hopefully most of your ops team members, if you know there's lawyers that are doing a particular thing and you can pull that work into your own legal ops team, yeah. it's a great way to say, go ahead, give me an extra head count at you know, X price point versus Y price point. Yeah. And let's make sure the lawyers are doing the stuff they went to law school for as opposed to some of this other stuff. And that's not to, to, to demean the work or say it's administrative oh, or any of that nastiness that we have to contend with. It's just more really being from an efficiency perspective when you look across and be like, that person shouldn't be doing that thing. And one of the examples that led me to get a data analyst on my team was our GC and some others were having all of the legal teams prepare these quarterly data reports, these metric reports, these beautiful presentations, which meant the lawyers and the contract specialists on the teams were the ones that out there gathering information and, and analyzing the data. And it was like, I just put the big kibosh on it. It was like, why, why are we using our lawyer's time and energy and brain power to do this stuff? when A, we can look into automation, but B, it really is something that naturally should flow into legal operations. Yeah, that's such a great point. It says that the consolidation of work, but, but the bigger one that finance also loves, and this is how you build credibility and trust and influence at the senior levels to get your investments is self-funding. Like you said, Lisa, you're actually self-funding that new role. Yes. And yeah. in many respects, then you're showing that there's the value of, of the legal ops role as well to be quite strategic about where you have your resources and what they're working on. Yeah, yeah I, I self-fund a lot of my roles. Um, yeah. The work you do in outside council management done well can fund the start of a legal ops new headcount or function. And then we have to be measuring headcount saved across the department. That's such a key indicator and make those trade-offs. So when you pitch future headcount, you can say, well, if you give me one here, I'll have a 10X return. You won't have to hire 10 additional lawyers or legal staff. And that's back to the data. I think it's looking at that insourcing. We always look, for example, privacy, huge explosive area now, cybersecurity. We wanted to self-fund cybersecurity attorneys, privacy attorneys and counsels and ops people because we were spending such an amount on outside counsel. And that insourcing, and that's why, you know, again, some of this data in the survey, it's directional. And there's a lot of different criteria based on where the particular company is. The pandemic has really influenced some industries more than others, probably healthcare and tech, you know, haven't yeah. been impacted. But using the data uh, is, is really important in your analysis. And yeah. that's how you also gain, gain credibility. So for me, this holistic look at the industry, that partnership with ACC getting this holistic look at what's happening year over year now, I think this report, we can really use it to monitor what's happening in the industry, but also just knowing there are other factors at play um, in every company and in every industry as well. Absolutely. Let's take a few questions here from our audience. I have one asked by a GC. Uh, One of our members is asking for them, what is the percentage of spend that is run rate versus a one-time expense, for example, in the external to internal spend numbers? From from my side, I mean, run rate for for me is our our annual legal budget, what we spend every year. And then, you know, that we take that number, what we spend every year, um, 
as a percentage of the company revenue yeah. and start out with finance at the beginning of the year to say, here are the investments, here's our forecast. Obviously during the year, things change. So we have to come in between plus, you know, one plus or minus 1% of our budget, but we tightly look at forecasting. Now, sometimes there's big material events that will happen that GCs have to, to work on. And those, we, we do separately capture them so that we can see how did we operate within the original budget? And then if there was something material, how did we handle that? Yeah. Um, I, I, run rate for me is, is, is the sort of steady state. Yeah. Um, for percentage of legal spend, I use the total legal budget as a percentage of revenue. I don't make a difference between run rate and investments. I just, they're all grouped all together, together. spend. Yeah. I think great examples of one-time expenses are some of your initial investments in technology, especially the way a SaaS provider and a company enter into business. Sometimes the pricing is heavier up front and the staffing need comes up front on a tech investment as well, but you'll hit a run rate in year two or year three, uh, usually with that technology investment. Anything, Lisa, from your yeah. side? Yeah, similar, Jen. There's other things that from a purely legal perspective are, again, I'm a little contrarian to Anya here, that I consider one-time expenses, right? And it could be that you have a very strategic deal that's going on that just the manpower on your own legal team can't handle, or it's just so strategic that you want to leverage a key partner at an outside firm, et cetera. I've seen that certainly happen. Or you know, take an acquisition. Those That is a very unique one-time expense. And kind of piggybacking off of what Anya said, in my past life, we had multiple budgets and we had the budget that was truly the legal must be accountable for these things and track to the budget. And that's what I would consider the typical run rate stuff. And then we had a different budget that wasn't necessarily quote unquote legal, it was more corporate. And say for instance, there was a breach notification and you had a major privacy violation. That was something that we kind of labeled this other bucket as sort of the unexpected. And so it could be a key litigation, it could be something in the privacy space, it could be something in the compliance space, right? There could be some key things that come up that you just, it would be really difficult to ask your GC to be able to budget for those unexpected items. Yeah. And so we had a separate budget for, for things that we would consider more unexpected. That makes sense. And, and this really brings up an important point and some of the frustration with benchmarking that I'm sure everybody feels. So there are some legal departments that will have run rate, kind of keep the business going, your legal spend, there'll be an unforeseen budget for unforeseen middle or unexpected, as Lisa said, that come in during the year. Then sometimes you'll have patent filings, for example, sitting in an engineering budget. You'll have M&A sitting in a corporate budget. But for us, we look at total legal spend. We gather all those together to truly have total legal spend as a percentage of revenue. But we hold ourselves accountable for what we knew at the start of the year to see what is our operational excellence like, and we, and we analyze the others as well. But that is the challenge of getting apples to apples on your legal spend as a percentage of revenue compared to competitors, <laughs> because depending what's included in that number, total legal sure. spend. You can have a couple outlier events like Lisa's talking about and have a spend percentage shift in that, in that ratio and not be happy about it when you're benchmarking to others. So it's a good note on, you know, you can benchmark with others, but you can't equate and to treat everything against the individual needs of your business. Sometimes the business needs to have some big litigation in the year to remain relevant in the market. And I think that's what legal ops professionals, and it was really beneficial to me in the early days, lots of my legal, my clock colleagues supported me on talking through the benchmarkings and what they were capturing. So I could articulate that well to finance and my GC, because you would have finance say things like, I heard legal percentage of revenue at this company is here, or they would get these benchmarks that were not calibrated correctly around what you know, yeah. our company was doing. So the, the legal ops community can be a great place to come to really, I think, um, have those discussions around benchmarking. Yeah. Meaningful discussions. Here's a good, uh, before we move on to the next session, one last section, one last follow-up question here, maybe for Anya. Do you have an example of how you've used the state of the industry report to convince your GC to act or any advice on how to team this up and frame it in a pitch? 
Yeah, I, I think getting a specific time on a staff agenda to discuss investments for the future and what the trends are and your competitors. You know, no one likes to think their competitors or other legal yeah. departments are ahead of them. So I think, you know, seeing investment and there's great resources on the clock website around building the justification for the role, a legal ops role. Then if you take this with the survey saying where the role should report, because there are lots of different roles within legal ops, but at least having the lead person have more influence really helps with the transformation. And also clock has been brilliant to engage different GCs. People have often asked me to talk to their head of finance or their GC if they're thinking of pitching the role themselves or GCs have often asked clock leaders for advice on how would I pitch that role. But I think um, use the data. Don't let this be a report that sits you know, in, in our inboxes, all of us. Let's, let's go out there and start talking about this to drive some positive change. And one thing I want to add to that, because again, there's, there's so much goodness here. From a legal ops perspective, and I would say to the community that's out there in specific response to this question of, you know, how do you tee it up? How do you frame it? How do you pitch it? Keep in mind, this is not just the conversation with your GC. In a lot of cases out there, we have really strong GC support, support for legal ops. What I would really encourage people to do is to get on the calendar, the agenda for the next legal management team meeting that whether they're your, if you report to the GC, they're your peers, right? But it's the heads of all of the different legal departments. And you have to do the work to fully understand and appreciate this industry report. And then during the legal management team meeting, take the opportunity to present and tee up the data that way, because what you're doing, great opportunity to pitch yourself great opportunity for your peers to understand this is a real thing because a lot of our peers and i hope i hope i actually hope i was the the only one experiencing this but i highly doubt it that i am a lot of my peers as very accomplished lawyers couldn't couldn't really care about legal ops yeah. but when i started presenting things like this state of the industry report and showing them all of the stuff that's happening across the industry in different companies of all sizes it's like they sort of sat up and took a little bit of notice that this thing was real and it goes to professional growth and development it goes to advancing your own career it goes to increasing your skill set i mean there's so much with this report that's the intangibles on what you can do with it, but take it as an opportunity to present to the entire management team so that they have a better understanding, they themselves have a better understanding of the role of legal operations, the importance and the breadth, right? Because a lot of times people can put their blinders on and be like, oh, this is a legal spend thing yeah. and that's all they do. And then you look at this industry report and you're like, wow, look at that whole list or the clock 12, right? Wow, look at that whole list of responsibilities. So great opportunity. An another great point. Don't just go solely to your GC, but your legal leadership. We need to, of course, have the support of GCs and make them a champion, but you, you are going to need other champions on your legal leadership to back you, to up-level initiatives, to innovate with you. So I look at it as I go out in front of all the leadership and I'm fishing, and I cast it out and I show this, I show the roadmap, uh, it, innovations or areas of investment in the year ahead that they can choose, pick and choose from. And I'm catching fish. And I get that one or two, you hook someone, they get excited, they latch onto something, they go, what, our competitors have this? What, you can save my lawyer's time from some of that lower value work. We can we can save our legal professionals time from data entry through automation and better tech. Let's go. We want to up the value chain. So it's important to get out there and fish for champions. And Let's one last, one we'll last yeah. is so finance partners. Get your finance, your CFO, your yes. finance partners. If they think that legal ops can help also drive some efficiencies as well as drive most companies of digital transformation initiatives. They've got so many things that have a mix of ops and, 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 and legal. I think that's a great, uh, another stakeholder um, that you can really use, leverage this report with. I always say finance are number one fans and legal ops. You don't have to sell them. You just show them what you're here to do. And they, they gracefully bow down and say, finally, order <laughs> is coming. Responsibility is here. Let's pivot. Let's get into professional growth. Lisa touched on it a little bit. So our profession is making a profound shift from tactical order takers to strategic thought leaders within our orgs 
and within our communities and ecosystem. So this section is really to unpack how do we successfully make this transition in our careers. For the audience, some stats that came out of the survey results, 27% of our results identified as legal ops directors, senior directors or associate directors, 23% as legal ops managers or senior managers. So we're talking upwards of 50% of the 200 respondents in that range in management level roles. And then another cut I saw was about a third of the respondents are in the director, senior director or VP ranks, right? So climbing sort of those executive ranks in legal ops roles. And they're not all lawyers also. Uh, I'm, I'm an example of that. So it is changing. Some insights from our community. We're seeing a slight rise in new executive and law program offerings at schools and institutes that are focused on legal ops and a lot on legal analytics. And more and more, we're seeing notable career shifts out into the ecosystem. Recently with our very own former president, Mary O'Carroll leaving Google, leaving the board and going to Ironclad, Mike Naughton going to Xmentium, Bob Taylor, Jeff Marple leaving Liberty Mutual and going to other companies on the vendor side like KPL and I believe Deloitte. So lots of interesting nonlinear moves here. So I'll open it up back to the panel what are the future careers in our legal ops industry? I mean, they all threw a bit of a curve. What are you thinking, Anya? I, I, I just love the cross-pollination yeah. and the, the fact that there's just so much opportunity. And I think it's great that the people move around because they get different perspectives. Yeah. But if I was starting over again and I was in law school, I'd say, you know, do an internship with a, in an in-house legal ops with a law firm innovation change lead with, with, a, with a vendor, a provider, a technology person to get that, that, that perspective of the different challenges so that you yeah. can really bring it, people together. And that idea of this collaboration and co-elevation to achieve, we're still quite siloed. And, you know, it's it just, I'm, I'm so thrilled that POC has brought the ecosystem together now and that we're having holistic conversations because that is how we will really, um, I think, influence change. I mean, for me, the kind of things that excite me and, uh, you know, I feel a great responsibility to invest in my own team who have worked so hard and who deserve uh, the attention and the development and all of our, our ops people. These are hard jobs and things are changing fast. So I think investing in the great people that we already have at getting them new skills, change management, org design. We did a lot this year on influencing on data programs for our people, you know, really targeted programs. But I would say data analytics, infrastructure simplification, everything comes down to data, but we still have not as an industry leaned in and done the hard work of simplifying our contracts and the way that we communicate with our customers and our vendors. That needs to happen before we will ever leverage AI. If we don't get a good taxonomy, if we don't get a handle on that, we're never going to be able to really benefit from AI and technology. So those kind of people are really of interest to me. And global legal services actually within in-house consolidating now, because there's bits of kind of ops work everywhere, as Lisa was also talking about, and we're consolidating everything into one group within the bigger departments and just looking out and getting uh, opportunities to sit on business teams throughout the companies as the ambassador and the representatives of legal with an ops lens and a legal lens, those people can be extremely effective as well for the GC, for the board, driving things that um, senior leadership at companies care about. So I just think it's an incredible time, but you have to invest in your own development and you have to invest in your team's development to be ready for the different changes in, in competencies and competencies uh, that people are going to need to really operate successfully uh, in this uh, sort of new world that we're in. It is a new world. And seeing some of the recent choices of our peers going out into the vendor ecosystem, to me, it introduces my favorite concept in life, nonlinear thinking, right? Sure, you can come into any corporation and go analyst, manager, senior manager, and climb the wonderful corporate ladder but you can put every solution in at your company that is available on the market, you will still find a hole because businesses have unique 
corners they're operating in. When you look at a Spotify or a Netflix, they're doing what has never been done in the history of mankind. So there could be a hole in an offering that you identify as an ops professional. I mean, Mary's going out to solve a big problem. That that was her statement because she sees a hole and hasn't seen a market solution really directly address it. So she wants to be a part of innovating. And I see a lot of our roles having an option to go that way. If you want to, if you're a hole filler, if you're a hole spotter and filler, Lisa, anything contrarian you'd like to add to the mix or are you agreeing on this? One? No, this is when I am in such alignment with you guys. The, it's like the world is our oyster right now. And it's up to us to kind of remove the blinders and not think so specific or so um, short-minded. And I almost, I almost kind of have this visceral reaction when I think of the question of future careers in legal ops, right? We, we need to even drop that kind of a concept. It's like legal ops is our springboard for anything that we want to do as we've been witnessing from some of our peers that are making these really different and interesting and fantastic moves. If you want to make an interesting and fantastic and different move, you have the ability to do that. I don't think there's anything about what we're doing now that would prohibit you from being a CEO of a company yes. because you are gaining, you are gaining so many skills and you're building off of the strengths that you have that can, can lead you into that path. If that's the path you want to be on. But most of us tend to, well, I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. That's too much of a stretch. I can't, I don't. Right. I mean, there's all of these self-limiting things. And so yeah. when I think about, future careers within ops. It can go anywhere and everywhere. And again, it's future careers in ops. For instance, like I think of a lot of people have mentioned whole chief of staff path and it's like, well, what, what can I do? So much of it is spinning, spinning what you already do to prove that you have the skills to do that first chief of staff role because guaranteed a lot of my ops colleagues are already doing the things in their day-to-day -day work that the chief of staff does. It's just, they're not thinking about how do I sell what I'm currently doing, what my current responsibilities are to prove out that I can take that first chief of staff role because you're already doing it, Yes. right? And so the future to me is wide open. It's just a matter of, again, <laughs> opening those blinders up to be able to span and be like, huh, I'm really good at X and I want to do it, right? And, and a lot of people don't, don't wanna do that self work. Yeah. They just wanna sort of be spoon fed of this is what your career path is to your point that it's linear and it's not linear. And it's up to you to get, get really creative and be like, I, I like doing X, how can I spin it into something different? Yes, what a great point. And I think you both are touching on skills required here. In our next question, we're exploring what skill sets are required to make the shift from manager to director, to VP, to exec ranks, C-suite or beyond? And I would love to throw this in because I talk about this a lot with my team and coach people. To become director and above, you have to have empathy. And I'm not talking about empathy and EQ is a big one. EQ and empathy that is only, how do you feel? Like, how are you feeling? And and talking about everyone's feelings, but EQ is about empathy, is about growing your team, uh, to Anya's point, into better versions of themselves and giving them some goals, accountability, structure, and coaching on milestones they can hit to grow in role and serve the needs of the business. It's about social skills and using the right social skill to get this work done, to spin, to Lisa's point, our work into bigger, better, more impactful things and to get budget. And there's a big people component to all of our work inside these corporations and your social skills will actually uh, help it to serve you here. So I, I am a big fan of EQ as a way of, as a measurement of your growth. And it's not a checklist. It's not how much work you did. It's not how hard you worked or how many projects you can spin on all your fingers. It's EQ, it's impact. And lastly, the ability to see over horizons and think strategically, that thinking is what's needed in leadership roles because you're always thinking two, three, five years out and grooming people to, to get there and to grow there with you. Not everyone is given the gift of vision. I've learned this uh, in, in my work. And so I have it great. And now how do I get my, my team working towards that and aligned with that? 
skills, thoughts, Anya, Lisa? Yeah, I totally agree. Horizon scanner, strategic influencer, but co-elevator of your peers yes. on the staff, but also your peers across the business. Because I love what was said in the session, um, the, um, the session that Dan did on, you know, one of the GCs said, I think it was Danielle, you know, legal is the central nervous system. We just don't know our own value yet. We actually see everything across, you know, sales contracts don't happen in isolation. We see the whole piece. Same with sourcing the vendors, all the risk there. And there's lots of data if we get our act together that we can bring that is very interesting to senior leaders. And I think we need to unleash that and embrace and be quite bold about being business leaders as well as legal leaders or legal yeah. ops leaders, because ultimately what we're trying to do is help a company, is that essentially all of us work for entities, organizations, or governments that are solving big problems at the moment. If you look at the landscape, it's extremely complex and scary right now, and a lot's changing. Those problems have legal dimensions. We tend to look at it in a siloed way, as Lisa, Lisa talked about, even as our careers, but also our roles as we're solving legal problems, we're not. If you're solving legal problems, no one's that interested. Yeah. <laughs> You've got to start solving business problems. Yeah, so problems. To get to that next level, you figure out the business problems and then you co-elevate and help drive change with business leaders. Um, and, and that what makes legal more relevant, increases the impact and ultimately helps people's careers as well. Um, so that would be such a Again, co-elevation. I'm seeing themes in, in Anya's answers here. Lisa, any yeah. any skills that stand out, soft skills especially? I'm completely with you on the EQ side. And and I will say say that with pure vulnerability and honesty, because I had to work, <laughs> I still have to work really hard at my EQ skills. And it is something that I feel held me back in my career early on because I didn't have them. And the level of um or lack thereof of empathy or compassion for other individuals was real for me. And it was truly something that, you know, day-to-day -day interactions I had to work on. And it's, if you are somebody that wants to shift up the line through management up to potentially C-suite, you're going to have a really hard time doing it without the concepts of EQ and without the ability to relate to people, to listen and listen well. Yeah. I think listening is one of those skills that you know, it's easy to just throw it out there and people think they do it and <laughs> no, they don't, it, they it, don't. And, and it builds on influence and advocacy are two of those other concepts that I really hold firm as a sort of trajectory that listening to somebody so that you can influence decisions and advocate for different things are absolutely critical the more senior you get. Yeah. You're in different conversations with, with even levels of people within your organization or even outside of your organization. And so to take the time to understand where somebody else is coming from, again, that key piece of listening, okay. critical, that's, absolutely that's critical. Empathy, that's active listening versus just listening. Yeah. Uh, empathy is by definition is walking in someone's shoes and feeling all the pain points and feeling their experience. And you can only feel it if you listen and hold back all of your reactions and biases. And uh, it, it's, those are the muscles for sure that we have to work on and, and keep going because in order to influence people to do what you want, which, which is what's best for the business you have to understand what motivates them, where they're suffering, where they're succeeding, and then design solutions that resonate with them. So there's, it's a bit of sales and psychology around circling around all of this. So any kind of courses, skills, online things, books, any of you can read to enhance those soft skills, do it. But, but I want to pause on that, Jen, because, and I should have done the research to be able to pull up the scientific data on this, but I know in my, in my past foray into kind of learning development, everybody thinks that taking a class is, is the key way we learn. And it's not, it's actually on the job work, right? And so I bring this up because often there's this theme of when is there gonna be like a certification program or when is clock gonna go in that direction or who's gonna be able to create some label that we've achieved these skill sets, right? And there's, there's value to it, don't get me wrong, but that's- it's when you think of, 
Yeah, when you think of how people actually learn, picking up a book is not going to be how you actually learn EQ skills. It's going to create awareness for you, which is fantastic. But it's it's the day to day. It's mm -hmm. keeping it's keeping it top of mind. It's keeping mindfulness. I'm I'm in a wonderful program right now about being a conscious leader, and and it's those sorts of skills about empathy and compassion and active listening and presence and creating space for people. Right. Those are the kinds of things. It's not you're not going to pick up from reading a book. Right. That you have to be able to practice them and be have that self awareness that every interaction you have, no matter who the person is, whether internal, external, whatever level, gives you an opportunity to build these skills, okay. to really improve, and to be able to position yourself. Books give us frameworks to frame it all up, but it's time working on the job. And, you know, some Mary has been known to say the best degree to get for our work is an MBA. And I wholeheartedly disagree because yeah, I did you. and I would never get an MBA. What a waste of money unless you're going to like investment banking or something very niche or Stanford or UPenn or something. But I did five years on the job training in a giant legal department. And as a legal professional who they couldn't pay to go to law school, I had to learn how to listen to lawyers and what they're what makes them tick and what makes them nervous. And five years was my MBA. And I actually have a master's in social work that I got in my youth and built my empathy muscles. And I would advocate that that's a more valuable degree because you can understand <laughs> people and problems and guide them to solutions. And you come in, I've come in with empathy muscles. Sorry, I'm ahead. I, but, um, I agree. I was asked to take on this legal ops role eight or nine years ago. I had a very nice EMEA GC role and I was terrified because I knew nothing about this area. And that is the best way to learn is to be thrown in at the deep end. So for everybody's career, I think, put off your hand to do something really scary that terrifies you. Along the way, read some books, go to some courses. As Lisa said, it'll, it'll give you a bit of a security blanket, but really the hard, the hard lessons and the failures are the best way to learn. And as long as you have managers who are gonna be caring, empathetic and catch you when you need the support and are not going to, um, you know, hold you to perfection. We need to outlaw that perfectionism and just try and do these things and try and learn. And it's exciting. And that's exciting. what gets energized is learning to new things. Exciting. And clock remains on the forefront of learning and discovering and defining all these new career paths. We're introducing a new academic committee and education advisory board into our org so we can bring in those viewpoints and keep creating and designing new learning tracks and places for people to go and exchange ideas. Let's pivot to our last section here. My favorite, the unknown. So this has been a year of many unknowns and cultural shifts with a resounding call to do better, to be more resilient and to transform the status quo. That's in our legal departments, our jobs and in our communities. Some call outs from the survey. Diversity inclusion and inclusion jumped to the number one priority for our profession this year. The shift to a remote workforce has also made a big jump and has made automating legal processes and implementing new tech solutions more and more urgent than necessary. Across our member community, we're seeing members addressing DNI both internally and with our outside counsel tracking, using measurement tools and adherence to the Mansfield rule. That's really prominent right now. And for those that don't know, the Mansfield rule is a national movement in the U.S. to increase diversity in law firm recruitment and promotion practices. It was created by the Diversity Lab, named after the first ever female lawyer, Arabella Mansfield. And it, it was inspired by the NFL's Rooney rule, which requires the NFL to interview at least one minority candidate for head coach vacancies. The magic number in the Mansfield world is 30%. Why? Because that is what is scientifically proven to disrupt bias. That is the critical mass you need to disrupt bias. So on first, uh, returning to work planning, it's happening everywhere. Um, we're defining the next normal, and we're also witnessing this demand for environmental, social, and corporate governance programs in most companies, especially in the U.S. right now, and we had our first session on that at the Institute this week. So my question for the panel is how do we charter these unknowns in 2021 from ESG to diversity and inclusion to working remote and returning to work? Anya, I'll start with you. What should we be doing now to prepare and, and 
do you think ESG is going to fall into the legal ops bucket soon for management? I mean, look, DEI, you know, legal, and then how do you operationalize all of the practices in a company that you need to make sure that you counteract bias in the hiring process, in the in the promotion process. I mean, at, at, at VMware Legal, we sat, I sat for five years on the VMware Inclusion Council with our CEO. There was only eight of us building. I'm now on the ESG Council with another legal colleague of mine. There's no doubt that many GCs are going to be all, all over that. And again, it plays to our sweet spot. They're going to have to operationalize ESG, you know, privacy, sure. security, um, you know, the reporting, the governance piece, the climate. There's loads of regulations that are going to come on climate. How are they going to report on those capture it? It's, it's you know, for, for legal ops people, helping GCs, you know, wrangle that chaos to the ground and, and say, how are we going to report this? How are we going to hold people accountable? How are we going to operationalize that? Sitting on the operational leadership teams of the company for legal ops leaders is another great way to help GCs with that. Um, because I think it'll be huge. That and cybersecurity. I think that is another area you're seeing GCs take over and, and crisis management and comms. All of these require a lot of corporate communications, sure. which require a ton of legal review and a ton of judgment. So again, there's another area where I think building trust with customers and with employees and bringing all of that ESG piece, piece which now includes DEI together, is going to be... a for sure, an additional scope and area of opportunity for legal professionals and legal ops professionals. Agreed. Well, and it's also, it's a great opportunity for cross-functional work across yeah. your organization, right? Because what this kind of drives home for me is an experience that I had at Adobe where the ops lead of all of these various, whether it was marketing ops or finance ops or sales ops or legal ops, we all came together as a unit once a month, one, you know, however, whatever, right? And we would share processes and, and different things we were doing and things that kept us up at night and, and to give one visibility to everybody else across the org, everybody else in ops roles across the organization, what the challenges were in these different areas. Because, you know, ESG stuff, it's not new. It's just, there's heightened focus on it. And does it have to be in legal? No, of course it doesn't have to be in legal. No different than how you don't have to be a lawyer to be in a legal ops role, right? There's gonna be a lot of different permutations for how it gets handled. I'd like to say that there's not gonna be any right or wrong way of handling it. It's just, you know, it's wonderful that we have this focused attention on it to say, look, these things are real and we need to do something to address them. Now, can you be a thought leader in this space and champion for this in your organization? Absolutely. Is it a great professional growth opportunity? Absolutely. If this is something that gets you excited and passionate and you're passionate about, right? You can, you can bring all your ops people together. You can, you know, advocate to have one of these areas be brought into legal or to broaden legal's expanse to be able yeah. to handle or legal ops's role in all of this, right? There's a lot of opportunity here in very, very different ways. There's components of it that touch HR. There's components of it that touch marketing. So there's there's just, there's so much here that they need help. <laughs> they need help from yeah. people like ops people who are highly organized, focused on efficiency and effectiveness, have that sort of sense, the spidey sense of just getting things done. Getting things done. I'll say, we'll say it in the D-rated way. We get things done. And, this and, should be and just to build on Lisa's point, just like, you know, bringing all those operational people across the company together and driving, you know, change and being a force for good, helping your company be a force for good. I think that's clocks mission as well is bringing everyone across the ecosystem together to talk about why we don't have enough diversity yeah. and naming it and now starting to measure and hold ourselves accountable for progress because until at vmware we decided we were going to make it part of our compensation as senior leaders yeah. to be uh diverse leaders yeah. who are inclusive and to That'll get people programming dni <laughs> Exactly. Put their, mind, put their compensation on the line. Brilliant. Yeah, that and true. Law firms uh, and our alternative service providers, we need to call it out those law summits, the scorecards the clock is built, which includes for your law firms that discussion 
Um, I used them in our last summit and it was very effective um, to have that conversation and to start holding people accountable because we have to hold each other accountable if we wanna make some change here. On that note, in our real last question for the panel today, advice on implementing a diversity plan for outside counsel. Let's get tactical for a moment. Do we have thoughts? My deep thought is just do it. Turn on leads in your billing system and require it in your billing guidelines or suggest it strongly in your billing guidelines and measure that number. Measure the first number on those first fields you can capture on timekeepers and try to grow that number. Socialize it to your leadership, to your legal professionals engaging and say, hey, you're engaging firms. You have the power, the buying power as the engager often at companies. Here's the data, make a good decision with it. And measure this number quarterly, annually, and, and try to drive positive change. Lisa or Anya, thoughts? Yeah, so I used to have my preferred firms report on it every quarter. Every quarter we were having not just the report come out to me, but then the conversation about it. Wow, we're at X percent. Why did it go up? Why did it go down? What are you doing to keep this going in the right trajectory? The other comment I would make is get creative. There's not just this one way to approach it. One of the things I am most proud of doing in my career is implementing a diversity internship with my key law firms where it was purposefully driven to allow first year associates to share the experience between law firm life and in-house life for diverse candidates. And to piggyback of one of my other board members, right now in this concept of remote is a brilliant opportunity for us to bring more diversity into our legal teams. Mm -hmm. Because previously it was like, well, I'm just going to try and hire from this little group of people here in Silicon Valley because there's brilliant minds here in Silicon Valley. Of course there are, yeah. but there's brilliant minds elsewhere. In Idaho. Yeah. Getting the diverse pools, whether it's from historically black colleges, right? I mean, there's so many different places that now that we have this freedom where people understand you don't have to have your butt in a seat in an office, every single day of the week to be good at your job and to knock it out of the park. Now that we have this sort of open space to say, I'm gonna go internationally and get some cool talent, or I'm gonna go across the United States and get some cool talent. I just think we have, a, and, but you just, you have to be upfront about your ask. You have to let people know it's important to you because yeah. if you are not walking, <laughs> walking that talk, it's going nowhere. Absolutely. I'm, I'm hearing that the chat is on fire, which makes me so proud, Clock Community, because I'm out there in every chat, turning the whole thing upside down. Uh, so I love it. Um, but I love the themes we're hearing today. Get creative. I want to pull one of the questions that came in quickly and answer it with something we already said. Uh, a question came in, I believe budget and tools are two big obvious areas for growing from zero to one, a legal ops uh, department or developing the team, how can we move beyond this confine of only budget and tools into other areas of the clock core 12? Here's the answer. Everyone in this community, get your pen and paper out, get creative. All you need, go back two or three clocks. We, uh, Francis and I did a, how to start a legal ops program. And it's not all about headcount and budget. It's about road mapping. We have sessions historically on building knowledge management roadmaps. You can build a KM roadmap with no tools and no budget, harnessing everything that is in your department right now. How do you revamp the portals? No portal, make one for free on whatever IT tool, tech tool is internal at your company and drive change, get visionary about where that portal can go. I was the first ask legal portal. You were really asking Jen at Cisco. And behind the scenes, I'd go answer the question and put it into a knowledge bank. And people were like, this is a cool tool. I'm like, it's me behind the scenes. But when I left, <laughs> it productized it and made it more of a KM tool. So just get your pen and your slides out. Look up clock resources and start drawing. And use this, well, just, this survey, yeah. send it. If everybody takes the goal of get this survey out there, at least to at least five of your stakeholders yeah. within the month. Let's take some action on this data uh, and make it meaningful. Lisa, closing thought there. Yeah, you just got to do it. You just got to start. Do Don't get caught up in all of this self crap that holds yeah. you back. Just try. Be good with failure. It's 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 good. It's Fail. Good. Get creative. Fail fast. Move just on. do it, Nike. Don't get caught up in the crap. So in closing, we're recognizing today the growth of the profession, adapting to change, staying relevant, discovering new insights. 
please let us know if there are data points or topics we could expand this survey to include. It's important for us to include those so we can keep understanding and seeking new truths. We're, work's happening now in our COP member community on tech tools that will guide our growth and diversity tracking. It's important to know that the next survey comes out very soon. Is That's our compensation survey. And this is awesome. We're collaborating with ACC. And this will give us good market data to see how has our market worth changed? How is this industry growing and growing and growing? With that, I'd like to thank you all on the panel for joining us. And I hope all of you have a great rest of your day at the Institute. Bye for now. Take care. Bye.